Your recent speech at the Oxford Union went viral online. Millions of people watched you make the argument for British reparations to India, for a British apology to India for its colonial rule there. Uh, let's have a watch. The ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done, to simply say sorry, will go a far, far, far longer way than some percentage of GDP in, 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 form, in the form of, of, of aid. Truth, this is a subjective statement and may not apply in all cases. Powerful words there by you, uh, which won the day in that debate. Don't you worry, though, that one day, in the years to come, an independent Kashmir may ask India for similar reparations and a similar apology based on the same line of argument you advanced there, based on the fact that the Indian government, the Indian armed forces, raked violence, havoc, destruction in Jammu and Kashmir in recent decades? I think purely on, on the specific economic argument that I talked about how the, the British depredations deprived India economically, I think you will find that the contribution of the rest of India to the state of Kashmir economically vastly, vastly outstrips uh, any, 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 anything else. So the economic argument for reparations would never apply. The ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done to simply say sorry will go a far, far, far longer way than some percentage of GDP in, 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 form, in the form of, of, of aid. Secondly, as far as the wrongs that have been committed in Kashmir, Indians have been the first to acknowledge them, to take action. As a democracy, we have tried Human soldiers. Human rights groups we do not agree with you those at all on that. Amnesty publishes report after report saying Based soldiers in India rights, you know, have impunity in Kashmir. Impunity there have is the been word court that's martials, used. jailings, convictions. Military trials, no civilian trials of soldiers or police officers. No, there, there have been civilian trials, trials of police officers, absolutely. Yeah. There are policemen in jail today. To Amnesty International says, to date, not a single member of the security forces deployed in Jammu and Kashmir over the past 25 years has been tried for human rights violation in a civilian court. Well, they have, they, ha they have been court martialed, but it depends on how they define security forces. The police, who are the Jammu and Kashmir police, when they've been guilty of atrocities, they have been tried. Truth. Amnesty International has reported that no member of the security forces deployed in Jammu and Kashmir over the past 25 years has been tried for human rights violations in a civilian court. How do we know about atrocities? More than 96% of all complaints brought against the army in Indian-administered Kashmir have been dismissed as false and baseless by the army. How convenient. Well, I, I, you know, the fact is that some of these complaints are probably indeed baseless. But the fact is that co the co those complaints that had a basis have been taken up and so when taken. So when people say there have been hundreds of cases of torture and deaths, thousands of cases of sexual assault, you're saying all of the soldiers and police officers involved in that have been prosecuted? Well, I don't know that they've all been prosecuted. Truth, it's not specified what Sasi Tharoor means by trained, but Amnesty International has reported that no member of the security forces deployed in Jammu and Kashmir over the past 25 years has been tried for human rights violations in a civilian court. Did they have you, been you were minister in government, you were an external affairs minister, that... but when you were in government, what did your government, what did you do to hold Indian armed forces to account for the violence and chaos in Jammu and Kashmir? I have informally had contacts with the Home Ministry about some of the concerns that were brought to me by human rights groups that I've been in touch with. But the fact is that this was not within my area of responsibility, and I cannot interfere in the work of other government departments. No minister can in any democratic system. Truth, Sasi Tharoor states that he informally had contacts with the Home Ministry about some of the concerns that were brought to him by human rights groups, but it has not specified what actions were taken as a result. You talk about interference. Uh, when people say to you or any Indian politician, why not have a brokered peace deal in Kashmir between Pakistan and India? Why not let outsiders, the UN, the US, the EU, the good old Norwegians, come along and try and broker a peace deal to this seemingly never ending conflict? You all say we don't want any outside interference. That's right. Why? Well, for, first of all, I don't think we have any problem understanding each other, the Pakistanis and us. We don't need a third party. You have a problem to come meeting in each other? Well, as far as we're concerned, uh, if, if terrorism were to stop, we can talk about everything. Don't forget there have been talks about Kashmir as recently as during the governments of Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and General Musharraf but in Pakistan. given 68 years later your two countries still can't sort this problem out on their own, why not have outside involvement? You because, clearly are not able to do it on your because own. Because the fundamental problem in India nuclear powers. The fundamental problem in the India-Pakistan relationship is not Kashmir. It is the nature of the Pakistani you think state. It's not, you think it's not yeah, Kashmir. Well, they, th they say it is Kashmir. Well, so why should I do something I don't believe in? I'm telling you it's not Kashmir. Truth. 
The fundamental problem between India and Pakistan over Kashmir is not about Kashmir itself, but about the two countries' competing claims to the region. Both countries see Kashmir as an integral part of their national identity, and neither is willing to give it up. Kashmir is a strategically important region located in the Himalayas. It is a source of water for both India and Pakistan, and it also has reserves of oil and gas. The region is also home to a Muslim majority, which complicates the issue further. The dispute over Kashmir dates back to the partition of India in 1947. At the time, the princely state of Kashmir was given the choice of joining either India or Pakistan. The ruler of Kashmir, Maharaja Hari Singh, initially decided to remain independent. However, when Pakistani tribesmen invaded Kashmir, he appealed to India for help. India agreed to help on the condition that Kashmir would accede to India. The Maharaja signed the instrument of accession in October 1947, and Indian troops entered Kashmir. The war between India and Pakistan over Kashmir lasted for several months. In the end, India gained control of most of Kashmir, while Pakistan controlled a small portion in the north. The two countries have fought several wars over Kashmir since then, and the dispute remains unresolved. In addition to the competing claims to Kashmir, there are also other factors that contribute to the tension between India and Pakistan over the region. These include religious differences, the unresolved issue of the line of control, lock, and the presence of terrorist groups in Kashmir. The line of control is the de facto border between India and Pakistan in Kashmir. It was established in 1972, but it is not recognized by either country. This has led to problems such as the smuggling of goods and weapons across the lock, and the infiltration of terrorists into India. Terrorist groups such as lashkar e Tiber and jash e Muhammad operate in Kashmir. These groups are based in Pakistan, and they receive support from the Pakistani government. They have carried out numerous attacks in India, killing hundreds of people. I'm telling you, it's got to do... So how does this end? How it, does this end, Shashi? It only, it? it only ends when Pakistan stops being the kind of state it is, where the military, to justify its disproportionate share of its own country's assets, budget and GDP, foments hostility on both sides of its borders, both in India and in Afghanistan, to justify its disproportionate... Well, we just resources. talked about the Indian Army's fomenting of hostilities. How many, how many people, innocent people, have been killed in Kashmir and framed Look, as militants? Unfortunately, many... these tragedies have occurred because the Indian security forces have been deployed to protect against terrorism and militancy Shashi, coming from the Pakistan. you know and I know, in the 1980s, you were a UN diplomat, you weren't an Indian politician, you knew very well that the reason the Indian armed forces went into Kashmir was because of fraud in elections, because of people objecting to rule from Delhi and about election results. It didn't start with terrorism. But the terrorism came very soon after those disputed elections, and when it came, the security forces come in. Look, these are young people who are fearing for their lives. But the rest they have of the world is seeing two excesses. nuclear powers on the brink. Shouldn't we all be worried? I hope not, because so far, despite so many flashpoints, it has never come to that. Uh, the Pakistanis seem to prefer a strategy, to use one of their own expressions, of uh, bleeding India to death by a thousand cuts. And India, in turn, has uh, managed a strategy of resisting terror without resorting to war. But it has not been a happy situation, but I think, for anyone Many would say you've been involved. bleeding Kashmir with more than cuts. I wouldn't say that because I've been to Kashmir multiple times. I was married to a Kashmiri. My late wife was, was from a village which uh, had been, in fact, attacked by terrorists. She lost her childhood home because of terrorist attacks. So uh, there have been the, the, the stories are far more complex than your questioning implies, Mary. Yes, it is true that India has deployed its army forces into Kashmir many times. The first time was in 1947, when India intervened in the Kashmir War. India has also deployed its forces in Kashmir to counter the insurgency that has been going on in the region since the 1990s. The Indian government says that the deployment of its forces in Kashmir is necessary to maintain law and order and to prevent terrorism. However, the Kashmiri people see the Indian presence as an occupation, and they have often protested against it. The deployment of Indian forces in Kashmir has been a major source of tension between India and Pakistan.
Pakistan has accused India of human rights abuses in Kashmir and it has threatened to use force to liberate the region. The Kashmir conflict is a complex issue with no easy solution. The deployment of Indian forces in Kashmir is a major part of the problem, but it is also a necessary part of the solution. If India were to withdraw its forces, the insurgency would likely get worse. However, the continued presence of Indian forces also contributes to the sense of occupation among the Kashmiri people. The only way to resolve the Kashmir conflict is for India and Pakistan to find a political solution that addresses the concerns of both sides. This will be a difficult task, but it is the only way to ensure peace and stability in the region.